Good evening and uh, welcome to this fourth community dialogue of the Bridges of Memory series. Today we will address memories of the Holodomor, the Ukrainian famine genocide of 1932-1933. And we are very grateful to the Minnesota Ukrainian community for joining us tonight. Our guests are Luda Anastasievsky and Stefan Ivaskevich. On this occasion, um, the community dialogue will be moderated by Nika Srimak, who is a sociology PhD student at the University of Minnesota with specific interests in gender and collective memory after conflict and genocide, uh, including her native Balkans. Before I turn it over to Nika, let me briefly introduce our guests. Luda Nastasievsky, she's a native of uh, Ukraine, She's a chair of the Minnesota Ukrainian American Advocacy Committee, which represents over 14,000 Ukrainians in the state. She is also the programming director of the Ukrainian American Community Center, where she promotes Ukrainian culture, history, and current events, with a special focus on building awareness of the Ukrainian genocide, the Holodomor. Luda is a Minneapolis Public Schools educator with over 27 years of experience. She taught English and literacy skills to hundreds of immigrant students. And in 2015, Luda was nominated for Minnesota Teacher of the Year for her achievements in producing outstanding student outcomes and applying equitable instructional strategies to address disparities in academic um, achievements among diverse student groups. Thank you, Luda, for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to be able to work again with you and with the Ukrainian American community. Um, Stefan Ivaskevich, he is the grandson of a Holodomor survivor and a recent participant in an oral history project entitled Holodomor Impact on Minnesota's Ukrainian Community. Stefan is active in local in the local Ukrainian community life, having served on the board of directors of the Ukrainian American Community Center, Maidan, Minnesota, and the Ukrainian Heritage Festival. He studied history and cultural studies at the University of Minnesota, and he also worked as an undergraduate research assistant at the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And um, I assume this was years ago, uh, maybe during the time of, of Stephen Feinstein. He has uh, recently started to work on a manuscript about his family history, which is part oral history and part memoir. And uh, he will let us know more about this uh, during his presentation. And last but not least, uh, Stefan is the drummer in the Twin Cities premier Ukrainian wedding band, the Ukrainian village band. And Stefan enjoys sharing his Ukrainian heritage with a wide Twin Cities community. Um, uh, Stefan, thank you as well for, for being with us tonight. It's a pleasure meeting you on this occasion. And I very much look forward to, to the dialogue, the conversation, and uh, to learning from your community. So without further ado, I will um, pass it on. I will turn it over to Nika Srimak. Thank you for joining us tonight, everyone, and uh, have a good evening. with the first question, Luda. Um, could you first of all tell us a, a bit more about the Ukrainian community here in the Twin Cities? Um, yes, Nika, in a moment. First, I would like to thank Alejandro uh, for the warm uh, welcome and introduction in you too. And I would like to say that um, on behalf of the Ukrainian American Community Center that we are honored to be part of this project and we are happy to be here. Um, thank you for inviting us and thank you for including us. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. So uh, when, when I share the screen, you will not be able to see Stefan or me. So just bear with me, give me a second to do that. So Ukrainians in Minnesota and the United States, like many other immigrant groups, 
arrived in successful waves over time. The first and largest wave came in the period from 1880 to 1914 and consisted primarily of farm laborers seeking work in factories and mines and mills. Excuse me, I have technical problem and for some reason I cannot um, go to the next slide. Is that because I'm not in the video? Sorry, I'm going to have to stop sharing for just a second and um, let me maybe start the video and try it this way. Okay. I apologize, for some reason I can't. Oh, now I can. So if that was, um, apologies. This is the um, first time that we're trying this. Okay, all right. So um, then after the first wave of immigrants, a much smaller wave uh, limited by US immigration restrictions followed in the aftermath of World War I. Many of these immigrants received post-secondary education prior to coming to the US. These immigrants founded many of the churches and organizations that make up the local Twin Cities Ukrainian community. They also established Northeast Minneapolis as the geographic hub of our community, and that's where Ukrainian Community Center is located too. Um, after World War II, a new wave of political refugees came to Minnesota under the provisions of the Displaced Persons Act of 1948. The third wave of immigrants consisted almost exclusively of political refugees who came to escape oppression based on their ethnic background, political views, and religious beliefs. Among them were Holodomor survivors and the descendants of survivors. Arriving between 1948 and 52, this wave of immigrants founded youth organizations student groups, choirs, and other organizations. And most notably, they founded the Ukrainian American Community Center, which remains a key institution of local Ukrainian community life today. Uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the advent of an independent Ukraine in 1991, the fourth wave of immigration came uh, from Ukraine. I came with this fourth wave. Many of us are professionals who have joined and taken leading roles in established local Ukrainian institutions while maintaining close ties with friends and relatives in Ukraine. Many of us are multilingual. According to the 2010 census, there are over 14,000 Ukrainians living in the state of Minnesota, but many of them are not active, unfortunately. Among the newest wave of immigrants are also families, children, grandchildren, hold the most survivors. Thank you. That's Nika. great. Thank, thank you very much, Luda. Um, so do we turn to Stefan now? Stefan, could you please give us a, a bit of an overview of the Holodomor genocide? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And it is a pleasure to be here tonight with everyone. Um, I'd like to begin with a little bit of the historical background to the Holodomor. In the aftermath of World War I and the overthrow of the Russian monarchy in February of 1917, Ukrainian leaders seized the moment. They established a provisional government that in January of 1918 declared the creation of an independent people's republic. However, just as it was established, the Red Army invaded Ukraine. It's important to note that Ukraine had its own revolutionary experience at this time. Um, the Ukrainian People's Republic fought the Bolshevik Red Army for three years, 1918 to 1921, but lost its fight for independence. Uh, a quote from Anne Applebaum's book, Red Famine, Red, The Red Famine, aptly describes what happened in Ukraine after the invasion. The Bolsheviks came to Ukraine not so much as liberators, but as colonial power seeking, as a colonial power seeking resources. Wherever the Bolsheviks went, there were requisitions of foodstuffs, and the Ukrainian peasantry resisted and fought back. That 
Thus was established the problem, the dynamic that would plague the first decade of the USSR's existence in Ukraine, and that would prompt Stalin to choose genocide as a solution. Inclusion of resource-rich Ukraine was essential to the formation of the USSR. And though the Bolsheviks gained control of the country by 1922, things in Ukraine remained volatile. In the mid-1920s, a number of concessions were made in an effort to win Ukrainian support for the Soviet regime. Stalin, however, disagreed with these concessions. And once he consolidated his control of the Soviet state, he reversed them. He decreed the first five-year plan, which included the collectivization of agriculture. Collectivization gave the Soviet state direct control over Ukraine's rich agricultural resources and allowed the state to control the supply of grain for export. Grain exports would be used to fund the USSR's transformation into an industrial power. Ukrainian farmers were forced to surrender their land, their livestock and farming tools and work on government collective farms, kolhosps, as laborers. The majority of rural Ukrainians who were independent small-scale or subsistence farmers resisted the collectivization. The wealthy and successful farmers who opposed collectivization were called kulaks by Soviet propaganda, and you can see this in the posters here. Kulak literally means a fist, like a fist of a greedy fist holding on. They were declared enemies of the state and were to be eliminated as a class. My own grandmother's family was thusly targeted labeled as a kulak, um, and maybe in the discussion we can uh, talk about those details. These posters give you the idea of the language Soviet leaders used to create an image of an enemy. The Soviet secret police and the militia brutally stripped kulaks of their land and their homes and personal belongings, deported them to far off regions of the USSR, or executed them. Stalin also initiated mass scale political repressions through widespread intimidation, arrests, and imprisonment. Thousands of Ukrainian intellectuals, church leaders, and Ukrainian Communist Party functionaries who had supported pro-Ukrainian policies were executed by the Soviet regime. Ukraine, with its history of resistance to Soviet rule, was a threat to the Soviet regime. Historians have recorded about 4,000 local rebellions against collectivization, taxation, terror, and violence by Soviet authorities in the early 1930s. Rebellions were brutally suppressed by the GRU, uh, the Soviet secret police, the precursor to the, the famous KGB. Tens of thousands of farmers were arrested for participating in anti-Soviet activities. They were shot or deported to labor camps. These mass repressions, along with manipulation of state-controlled grain purchases and collectivization through the destruction of Ukrainian rural community life, set the stage for the total terror, the terror by hunger, or the Holodomor. Um, Holodomor is from the words meaning to kill by hunger. <clears throat> Fearing the opposition to his policies in Ukraine could intensify and possibly lead to Ukraine's succession from, secession from the Soviet Union, Stalin set unrealistically high grain procurement quotas. Those quotas were accompany, accompanied by other draconian measures intended to wipe out a significant part of the Ukrainian nation. In August of 1932, the decree of five stocks of grain stated that anyone even a child caught taking any produce from a collective farm could be shot or imprisoned for stealing socialist property. As famine escalated, growing numbers of farmers left their villages in search of food outside of Ukraine. Stalin and Molotov uh, issued decrees preventing them, the farmers, from leaving and started a system of internal passports, which were denied to Ukrainian peasants, so they could not travel without permission. At the same time, over one third of the villages in Ukraine were put on blacklists for failing to meet the grain quotas. Blacklisted villages were encircled by troops and residents were blockaded 
from leaving or receiving any supplies. It was essentially a collective death sentence. To ensure these new laws were strictly enforced, groups of activists organized by the Communist Party were dispatched to the countryside. They were taking away every single scrap of food they could find, even the potatoes that were cooked on the stove, literally leaving nothing. My own grandmother recalls her mother falling to her knees and crying at the foot of a soldier who had taken the last bit of bread that her mom had just baked as these grain requisitions made their way through the village. Millions of men, women, and children were slowly starved to death in the early 1930s. <clears throat> when the state confiscates not only grain, but any and all foodstuffs, its intentions are murderous. There can be no other explanation. What was happening in the Ukrainian countryside has been described by witnesses to the whole of the Mor, who were fortunate enough to survive. There are hundreds of documented and published testimonies asserting that the search brigades confiscated not only meat and potatoes, but all available foodstuffs. It was a mass murder, planned in advance and well-organized, not only <clears throat> of those whom the Kremlin regarded as saboteurs, but murders also of children and the elderly. This is how and why one can say it was genocide. The term Holodomor is often used to encompass the starvation of the farmers as well as a broader assault on the Ukrainian nation, which included at this time also an attack on the cultural, religious, and political leadership of Ukraine, most of which was at that time under Soviet rule. Consequently, the largest non-Russian ethnic group within the Soviet Union, the Ukrainians, were decimated, putting an end to their aspirations for autonomy and independence for decades. I'll conclude with this slide. <clears throat> Rafael Lemkin, the author of the word genocide and initiator of the Genocide Convention, called the destruction of the Ukrainian nation a classic example of genocide. In accordance with the UN Convention, Lemkin considered the following items as an integral part of the genocide against Ukrainians. Starvation of Ukrainian farmers, extermination of Ukrainian intelligentsia, and elimination of the Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church. And one more quote. Uh, is the Ukrainian Holodomor genocide? Yale historian uh, and professor Timothy Snyder believes it is because Unquote. It meets the criteria of the law of genocide of 1948, the convention, and it meets the ideas that Raphael Lemkin laid down. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that history. I know it's it's truly shocking uh, how little the, this story is known for many, many people in the US, I think, speaking mm -hmm. from personal perspective. Um, could you perhaps also tell us a bit, Stefan, what it was like for you personally growing up as the grandchild of a Holodomor survivor, as you mentioned and as Ella Hunter mentioned earlier? Yes, with pleasure. Um, these are images of my grandmother. Um, first, as a 16-year-old girl, so she is the older uh, girl seated with the image of the candle, and then many years later. She was born in a village that was 14 kilometers from the city of Poltava, called Chorno Hlazivka. She was eight years old at the time of the Holodomor. Um, she never really talked about Holodomor as I was growing up, and this was very surprising because she loved to tell stories. She would tell us vivid tales from her memories of her childhood in Ukraine. Um, I could sketch for you from her stories an almost complete picture of her childhood village or even of her mother and father's face. Um, most of these stories were very pleasant stories and images that she told us, but there were some also darker stories that she frequently talked about, but not about Holodomor. Um, not only did she survive Stalin's 1933 uh, genocide, she also survived World War II as an Osterbeiterin. So as someone who was taken from her village to Germany as a slave laborer in a concentration camp. She often, very often, told us stories about the horrors of the experience uh, in, that, in that camp, but also uh, stories of incredible moments of grace and 
human goodness in which good people saved her or other people's lives. So she told us these childhood and World War II stories frequently, really to anyone who would listen and um, anyone who wanted to hear the stories, but she never spoke of the whole of the more. She only made few vague references now and then about the starving times. And I've always been a passionate reader of history and it was only sometime in high school um, that I first understood for myself that my Baba, my grandmother, was a Holodomor survivor. I was reading Oras Subtelny's um, English Language History of Ukraine. At the time, a very important book that was kind of signifying a growing interest in Ukrainian studies in the West. And it hit me where she was born. Um, she had to have survived. Where and when she was born, she had to have been a Holodomor survivor. And she was from one of the hardest hit, hit regions uh, during the Holodomor a region of Ukraine that some liken as the Ukrainian cultural heartland. Um, <clears throat> but she only ever mentioned it in passing as the starving times. So it took me the better part of 10 years uh, to ask her again and again to recall her memories for the Holodomor before I started to feel satisfied that I'd heard everything she had to say. But every conversation about Holodomor was short. She was not forthcoming with information, not at all like she was about her childhood or World War II. Um, and she would often ask me to stop writing things down or I had a tape recorder, she'd ask me to stop recording. And once in a while would ask me why I was so interested in Holodomor. <laughs> um, so I only once asked her um, why she herself was so hesitant to talk about it. Uh, when she so often talked about the other details of her life. And her, her answer was simple, that it, she didn't like to talk about it because it was much harder to remember. So for her, there was a silence that fell upon the whole of the more. And that's something that Ukrainians are dealing with to this day. Um, would she have spoken more freely had there been not such a deafening silence about the whole of the more for so long, enforced by the Soviet state, uh, it's, it's a question I think about all the time. Um, this last slide here uh, to address what it's like for me to be a Holodomor, um, the grandchild of a Holodomor survivor, that is my eldest child who did a project for History Day, seventh grade History Day project, the state of Minnesota and public schools um, participate in, uh, in seventh grade a History Day uh, project sponsored by the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, and uh, the project made its way to the final stages at the Minnesota State. And I'm very proud of the fact that my child came to me wanting to do this project. And that's that, it. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Stefan, thank you. Kind of brings everything full circle to, to see your child there. Um, Luda, could I turn to you now and could you tell us a bit about how your Ukrainian community in the Twin Cities or, or broader Ukrainian community commemorates the genocide and about its role in the Ukrainian community today? Yes, with pleasure, Nika. So uh, Ukrainians commemorate the whole of the on the fourth Saturday in November. And uh, these commemorations traditionally happen in each family home and include a moment of silence and the lighting of candles placed in window sills. So on, uh, you see one of the uh, pictures here that shows uh, a campaign, light a candle of memory in your window. This campaign was suggested by historian and researcher James Mays in 2003 who dedicated his life to the study of Voldemort. We'll be talking about him later too. So this tradition began in Ukraine, but it continues, uh, but it spread all over the world. And that's what we do here also every year. We also commemorate uh, Voldemort through community events, exhibits on the history of the Voldemort, art installations, educational events for children, and community candle lighting vigils. So I'd like to share a very special commemoration that happened uh, um, in 2018. It was 85th anniversary uh, of Holodomor, and it took place at the Ukrainian Community Center. Um, 
with participation of all local community organizations and Ukrainian churches. As a tradition, uh, the program began with a moment of silence and candle lighting ceremony and the ecumenical memorial service. Our Holdemore survivors, Olha Horolet and Wanda Bahmed, uh, who survived Holdemore's children, were honored at the commemoration of this uh, 85th anniversary of the Holdemore. And we were fortunate to have a guest speaker, the keynote speaker was Sophia Isai, Assistant Director of Education for the Holdemore Research and Education Consortium at the University of Alberta in Canada. We were very grateful because she got sick and we act she actually had to do it over Skype. Um, so that was very special. In preparation for this event, the local Holodomor Commemoration Committee surveyed the Ukrainian community to identify families of Holodomor victims and survivors. And then a wall of memory was created to honor them. Um, and last fall, uh, the Ukrainian American Community Center collaborated with the Ukrainian consulate in Chicago to bring a traveling Holdemore exhibit from the Ukrainian National Museum in Chicago. And so during the months of November, which is the Holodomor Awareness Month, the Holodomor exhibit uh, was presented at Ukrainian churches and at the Ukrainian Community Center. Um, and he, uh, and the exhibit also was uh, presented at the Ukrainian Community Center for the children of the Ukrainian youth organization and their parents. Uh, it, it created a huge interest in our community. We also had guests um, from uh, outside the Ukrainian community. And then finally, the Holdemore exhibit traveled to my school. I collaborated with my school social studies teacher in creating a lesson on Holdemore, which was taught to seventh and eighth graders and students and staff visited the traveling Holdemore exhibit, um, which was displayed in our media center. So to answer the question, uh, what is the role of the Holdemore commemoration in our community? Uh, I think it brings the community together. It creates space for mourning, for reflecting, for educating and making connections between the past and the present. Holdemore commemorations also raise awareness not only among the members of our community, most of them are obviously aware of it, but among the general public as well. By commemorating the Holdemore, we are fighting the denial, which still continues, stating to the world that we have distinct history and culture. It's an act of preservation of our identity. There is another very important way that we commemorate the 85th commemorated the 85th anniversary of the Holdemore. Uh, it was a creation of the local oral, oral history project, uh, which collected testimonial interviews of survivors and families of survivors living in Minnesota. And Stefan was very heavily involved in this effort, so I'll let him now tell you about that. Sure, hi. Uh, yes, last year, our Ukrainian community, local community, achieved an important milestone um, with the um, fabulous leadership of project director Zina Politz Gutmannis. Uh, we worked with a small team to conduct interviews with three generations of Holodomor survivors in our local Ukrainian community. Um, we received pro bono consultant, consulting assistance from Sofia Esayu, the leader and who is the lead interviewer of the Children of Holodomor Survivors Speak, an oral history project at the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center. Sophia advised us in developing questionnaires and interviewing techniques, and we are very grateful for the help. Um, Holodomor survivors and their descendants shared their memories about surviving Holodomor and World War II, about post-war their lives in post-war displaced person camps, and about contributing to the Ukrainian community here in Minnesota. This is the first ever project to look at three generations of Holodomor survivors, and as such is already receiving a good deal of interest as a model for other projects, and has already been presented at national and international conferences on Holodomor studies. On this next slide, 
uh, shows uh, the moment that the project, well, the project received a grant from the Minnesota Historical Society. And the grant was administered by our Ukrainian American Community Center. Um, and last fall, participants of the oral history project, their families and friends and community leaders, all gathered at the Anderson Library at the University of Minnesota to transfer the project results, audio and video recordings, and manuscripts of the interviews to the archives of the Immigration History Research Center, where they will be available to researchers and educators from around the world. We're very proud of that effort. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Stefan, and great to have these oral histories in the, um, the UMN libraries. I know it's great to have public access to those mm -hmm. for researchers and for the, the uh, the whole community. Um, I'm wondering if you uh, wanted to speak a bit about why you think it's important to raise awareness about the whole of the more, either externally or in your internal community. Um, Nika, I, I think our slides are, are structured for a different question. I'm sorry, it's about denial and um, um, sure. Of course, yes. Um, no, I'm glad. I thought you had wanted to skip over that. But I did want to ask you about whether you have encountered silencing or denial of the genocide in all of this, uh, in all of these efforts, and how have Ukrainians and Ukraine as a country dealt with that? How have they been able to gain external recognition for the genocide? Um, when I started to think how to best approach answering this question, I realized that I had never been asked before whether I personally encountered sil silencing or denial of the Holodomor genocide. And I hope that sharing a little bit of my personal story can help you understand my perspective on how Ukraine and Ukrainians dealt with the silencing of the genocide. Um, I spent the first 26 years of my life in the Soviet Union growing up behind the Iron Curtain experiencing typical Soviet schooling and the best traditions of Marxism-Leninism and speaking Russian. You have to understand that my grandmother spoke Ukrainian, or more precisely Surzhik, a mix of Ukrainian and Russian. My mother growing up attended a Ukrainian language school that was still miraculously functioning in the 50s, but was shut down by the time she started high school. By the time I started school in the 70s, there were no Ukrainian schools left in my city. I considered myself Ukrainian, my family considered them, uh, them ourselves Ukrainian, but we couldn't get schooling in our language. We did not learn our history, culture, and we had no access to the outside world. Repressive policies that were applied to the Ukrainians during the time of the Holodomor were continued to be applied for 50 more years after the Holodomor. So when you asked me the question whether I encountered silencing or denial of the Holodomor, Yes, I have. I encountered the silencing of the Holodomor growing up in the Soviet Ukraine. And um, I didn't know anything about the Holodomor at that time. Uh, it was simply not part of the school curriculum, history curriculum. Conformity was encouraged. Critical thinking, in quotes, was allowed only within official Marxist-Leninist doctrine which was the only approach allowed in schools, universities, research, and the press. So when we talk about Ukraine's and U Ukrainians' response to hold the more denial, we have to understand that in addition to losing millions of independently-minded farmers, hold the more lost uh, during the hold the more, Ukraine also lost its leadership. 80% of the uh, smartest, most dedicated people were destroyed in the 30s and then replaced by Soviet non-Ukrainian officials. A huge demographic shift happened at the time as well. Abandoned Ukrainian villages and depopulated regions in Ukraine were repopulated with migrants from Russia and Belarus. By the way, it's the Kremlin's favorite tactic in order to keep its political and economic hold on the former Soviet republics. The Kremlin used it successfully then, and it continues to use to, the, to this day. Russian government wages its proxy war on Ukraine. It's been waging for the past six years. 
It brought in hundreds of thousands of Russian citizens into the Russian-occupied Crimea and Russian-occupied territories in eastern Ukraine in the past six years. Soviet communist authorities enforced the policy of Russification and building a Soviet man. The one that I experienced as well. Holodomor was a taboo subject. Those who survived Holodomor were afraid to speak out of fear of persecution. In Soviet Ukraine, Holodomor was kept out of official public discourse until shortly before Ukraine won its independence in 1991. We now know that explicit instructions were issued throughout the Soviet Union banning the use of the word famine, not only in party and military documents, but also in medical records and statistical accounts. As a result, Ukrainians didn't have a chance to process that trauma, to grieve for those who perished, and even to fully understand what was done to them. Finally, when Ukraine became independent in 1991, um, Ukraine passed, a spo um, passed the law that defined the Holodomor as genocide in 2006. And that law became the political and legal basis for a large-scale official investigation uh, of the 1932-33 crime of genocide in Ukraine. Thousands of documents and hundreds of testimonials were collected, including information about the mass graves where the victims of genocide were buried. Thousands of registration books about deaths in 1932 and 33. Thousands of testimonies of witnesses and victims and also thousands of declassified documents of the Communist uh, Party, among other evidence. So meanwhile, uh, about 40 years ago, Ukrainians in North America uh, devoted um, a great deal of effort to publicizing the famine of 32-33. A result of those efforts was creation of the U.S. Congressional Commission on the Ukraine famine in October 1984. In early 18, 1988, the commission prepared its final report and presented to the American Congress. It was almost entirely written by James Mays, a young American historian and a postdoc fellow at Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. Three years of research by the U.S. Congress Commission on Ukraine famine were boiled down to 19 conclusions in this report, and one of them is Joseph Stalin and his entourage committed genocide against the Ukrainians in 1932-33. It was based on the testimonies of 210 surviving victims of the Holodomor. The silence and denial finally started to fall away, away in, the, in the 80s when the famine became a subject of scholarly study and public attention in the West, largely through the efforts of the Ukrainian diaspora communities centering on the 50th anniversary of the famine in 1983. Here in the slide, you see 18,000 Ukrainians gathered in Washington, D.C. to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Holodomor. And then, um, In 1983, also, something special happened in our local community. One of our uh, Holodomor survivors was interviewed by Minnesota Daily, the University of Minnesota Daily newspaper. Uh, Nina Kubik was the Holodomor survivor from Kharkiv region in Ukraine. She shared her memories publicly for the first time since she came to the U.S. She was um, only eight years old during the Holodomor. And in her interview, she said that she was afraid to dredge up the memories of the famine for fear of uh, reprisals by the Soviet government. That's why she didn't speak out before. And for the fear of being denied a visa to visit her remaining relatives in Ukraine. Still, she spoke up. She recalled the belly near her house where all you could see, quote, were bones and bones of people who have died. And during the cold winter months, Nina's family survived on ground corn cobs mixed with a tiny bit of flour. Many people did not have even that. Powerful testimonies like Nina Kubik's and continued efforts in the Ukrainian diaspora helped raise awareness and recognition of the Holodomor among American public and among elected officials. And um, in 2018, U.S. Senate adopted a resolution commemorating the 85th anniversary of Holodomor that stated 
that Joseph Stalin and those around him committed genocide against the Ukrainians in 1932 and 33. And Senator Klobuchar from Minnesota was one of the co-signers. Uh, I have to say that the members of our advocacy committee work with all of our representatives and senators uh, educating them about the issues related to Ukraine. Um, the Holodomor has been recognized as genocide by 16 nations and 22 U.S. states. To raise awareness about the Holodomor here in the Twin Cities, our Holodomor committee requested proclamations from the Minnesota governor Mark Dayton and St. Paul Mayor Melvin Carter. And that's our contribution, our community's contribution to the recognition of Holodomor. And even our participation in today's uh, Bridges of Memory event is also a way for um, Ukraine and Ukrainians uh, to support Holodomor recognition. So we're very uh, grateful uh, to you for providing to the center, for providing us with the platform to amplify our voices. Um, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Luda. Yes, of course, we appreciate it too, uh, the opportunity to hear about this and learn from both of you today. Um, and perhaps, uh, Stefan, if you want to take this next question about why you think it's important to raise awareness about the Holodomor. Certainly. Um, well, we just heard a great deal about how there are many who still deny or Many, I don't know if I want to say that, but there are those who deny the Holodomor and that Soviet crimes uh, were perpetrated in 1932 to 33, um, in spite of all the evidence that's been gathered and presented. Um, for Ukraine and Ukrainians, international recognition of the Holodomor as a genocide is crucial for our own memories and our own narratives. It's, it is important when others recognize the truth of what you are saying about yourself and become your allies in a struggle against those who deny or outright lie about your past. I really believe that such solidarity strongly influences um, one's own self-perception and, and the self-perceptions of Ukrainians in a very positive, positive and powerful way. Um, another reason is that it's important to remember because history tends to repeat itself. Um, raising awareness about the whole of the motor, we are raising awareness about the current situation in Ukraine. Um, and just like during the times of the whole of the motor, Russia's government continues its colonial policy. Um, and in addition to military invasion is using tools of disinformation, denial and obfuscation as weapons in a hybrid war of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, which is once again forced to defend its independence and territorial integrity. Just like Soviet R Russia denied its role in the whole of the Mord of Russia today denies any active role in the Donbass or the eastern part of Ukraine, um, a portion of which Russia today occupies, or its role in the occupation of Crimea. Um, I really like this quote um, in his review of uh, Red Famine, the Yale historian and Professor Timothy Snyder said, um, the Kremlin justified the Russian invasion with the claim that the Ukrainian nation did not exist. That is the kind of thing people say when they align themselves with the history of imperialist mass murder. A past policy of destroying a nation has become a present claim that the, ne that the nation never existed. Uh, remembering our past is important. Young people need to be aware of the consequences of ideologies and to develop a moral compass. Uh, this awareness can be fostered by visiting historic sites and museums, uh, by reading biographies and firsthand accounts, listening to your elders and re reading their oral histories or watching documentaries. So I'd like to tell you about one person from our local Ukrainian community, Slavko Nobitsky, who is a trailblazer in raising the world's awareness about Stalin's crime against Ukraine. According to the Ukrainian Weekly, <clears throat> Mr. Novitsky is perhaps best known for being an international award-winning documentary filmmaker committed to, in his own words, exposing man's inhumanity to man. 
particularly with his exhaustively researched disruptive accounts of Ukraine's traumatic history of the last century. Uh, Slavko Novitsky's 1983 film, Harvest of Despair, was broadcast on PBS and it was widely accessible document revealing Stalin's genocide of Ukraine's famine. Um, <clears throat> Harvest of Despair is featured on the Holodomor Guide page of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Um, so young people need the opportunity to be exposed to historical events and this documentary helps keep the memory alive. Um, Holodomor awareness is also important because in, it promotes an understanding of other cultures and ethnic groups teaches lessons about the devastating impact of exclusionary politics, especially when those politics are backed by the full power of a state. We all can learn lessons pertaining to giving a voice to the excluded and the voiceless. And then to bring it really home, there are also lessons I believe that the Holodomor, study of the Holodomor teaches, such as lessons about the renaming of places with Native American names, uh, why it's so important in other instances of genocide, or regarding the power of monuments and the desire to tear them down. And that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much, Stefan. Could you tell us a bit more about how the Ukrainian community passes on the memory of the Holodomor to your younger generations? Sure. Yeah, getting, getting the youth interested is not always easy, uh, especially in history, but it is important. Um, in our community, we try to teach our youth about Ukrainian history in general, and specifically about the Holodomor. Uh, younger students can be engaged in conversations about the Holodomor by explaining by exploring their family trees or doing hands-on projects like making the Holodomor bread, mainly consisting of seeds and grass. Um, other students can get involved in commemorations and candle lighting ceremonies through our youth organizations or churches, in addition to having history lessons. I love this picture because some of my kids, the previous one, but that's okay, <laughs> are, in, is in, are in that picture. Um, yeah. Two years ago, for the 85th anniversary of the Holodomor, um, children from the Ukrainian Youth Association, our local, one of our local scouting organizations, participated in an international campaign called Light a Candle of Remembrance. They lit candles and read out loud 85 names of children who perished during the Holodomor. This commemoration took place in 85 cities around the world over 85 days leading up to the 85th anniversary. Um, our local remembrance was held at the Ukrainian American Community Center, and we'd like to play a little bit of that video for you. Oh, oops. Yeah, or play a little short snippet of a video that was done at that time. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I have to. That's so, okay. That's... I'm trying to move the slide to the next slide, okay? I'm just trying to see what I have to. Huh? 
Sorry, don't let me move. I apologize. Um, I'm gonna just do the July Sorok Per Show. Pardon me. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second. I'm sh sorry. Um, I think we've all gotten used to some technical technical difficulties in the time of COVID, right? <laughs> Um, I'm very, oops, here we are. Sorry about this, everybody. My apologies. So this year, our student, students from the Ukrainian Youth Association visited the Traveling Holodomor exhibit. Um, there are efforts each year in our community to hold a community-wide commemoration event whereby speakers talk about the Holodomor. There are presentations about the Holodomor and moments of silence and honor of its victims at local Ukrainian churches and at the Ukrainian center. And in general, families share stories and memories with their children. I certainly can talk, I certainly do talk a great deal about my grandmother to my children. Um, and I'm really pleased that they often ask me to repeat the stories. And these are some of the myriad ways that we in our community are uh, educating our youth about the whole of the more. That's great. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Luda, I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about how your community preserves its identity and culture, broader culture here in the Twin Cities. Well, our Ukrainian co community uh, continues the traditions that were started by the uh, all waves of immigrations before us. And um, they've established numerous uh, organizations, uh, places and uh, churches and our Ukrainian center, events, groups. So we, uh, we are privileged to continue their legacy. After the revolution of dignity in 2014, uh, we established much closer ties with Ukrainian musicians, filmmakers, artists in Ukraine. And Ukrainian Center ho uh, hosts festivals, concerts, movie showings, lectures, classes, exhibits. Um, we have a flourishing Ukrainian folk dance ensemble called Cheremosh. Chere sorry. Cheremosh traces its roots to the Ukrainian folk ballet of the Twin Cities, which began in 1934. Nearly 80 years after founding members performed at the Schubert Theater, our dancers performed at that same theater, which now operates as the call center for dance and the performing arts. And then in 2017, Cherimosh dancers, parents, community members were excited and honored to welcome an ambassador of Ukraine to the US, Valeri, Valeri Chali, at the annual spring concert. And Ambassador Chali awarded the Cherimosh Ukrainian Dance Ensemble uh, led by Ken Matlashevsky, its artistic director, with honorary diploma of the diplomatic mission for promotion and support of Ukrainian culture in Minnesota. So our um, Ukrainian culture is thriving and with the arrival of new immigrants, it continues to uh, develop and um, people get more involved and it's exciting to, to have all of this new uh, arrivals. So that's all I have to say for right now. I'm also trying to manage time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, we will switch over to questions in a few moments. So please uh, feel free to put your questions uh, in the chat if you haven't already, and we'll get to those in just a moment. Um, Stefan, I'm wondering, Bob, one last question for you, if there's something you would like everyone to know about the Holodomor or the Ukrainian community? Well, primary is uh, what we've discussed a lot already, that Russia to this day continues the Soviet tradition of denial. Um, that's the most important thing for me that people take away. Um, but at the same time, um, about our local Ukrainian community, I would just like to mention, we do have quite a few uh, really interesting local 
uh, dignitary, shall we say, we already mentioned the filmmaker Slavko Novitsky. There's also Heidi Stefanishin, who is a NASA astronaut uh, from our local Ukrainian community. And I could go on, Ukrainians love to recitate who are all the famous Ukrainians, so sometime, another time, I'll talk about that. But another thing, the last thing I'll mention, um, I have not had an opportunity yet to see this film. I'm very excited to see it. Um, <clears throat> but I do recommend checking out a new film about the Holodomor called Mr. Jones. Um, in reference to a journalist who covered events in Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> the screenplay for the film was written by a Ukrainian American historian and journalist named Andrea Chalupa and uh, directed by three time Academy Award winning um, director Agnieszka Holland. Um, Andrea compiled much of the research she did for this film into a book called Orwell and the Refugees The Untold Story of Animal Farm, which has been used uh, in classrooms in Canada and Ukraine through a genocide education program called Orwell Art. So check it out, uh, let us know, or let the world know what you think about, about it. But uh, my understanding that it is a well done film. That is great to know. Thank you, Stefan, uh, for people mm -hmm. hoping to learn more about the whole Demoir. Uh, Luda, I'm wondering, last question, and then we'll go to some uh, Q&A, if there is anything else you had wanted to mention that we haven't yet been able to talk about. Well, since our primary audience uh, is educators, I, uh, and I'm an educator as well, so I'd like to use this opportunity to recommend a wonderful teaching resource for all the more by Valentina Kurilio who is the Director of Education for the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium, entitled Holodomor in Ukraine, the Genocidal Famine of 1932-33. I want you to know that it's not just for educators though, but for general public as well. It um, features standalone teaching materials, lesson plans and assessments with sensible and basic information about the famine. Um, I'd like to also use this opportunity and on behalf of the Ukrainian Center and myself personally, thank Valentina Kuriliev and her uh, and Sofia Isayev for their invaluable support in our journey as Holodomor educators. Thank you very much. Also, I would like to use this opportunity to thank um, the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies um, for inviting us to participate, for giving us a platform, uh, for being such wonderful partners. We really, really appreciate it. And we hope that this partnership will continue into the future. So thank you, Alejandra, Joe, Nika, George, for putting together this event. And thank you, Nicole and Maria, uh, our ASL interpreters for helping us with this event as well. Thank you to our wonderful audience, whoever came to uh, uh, participate, to listen to us. Um, thank you so much as well. It was a pleasure. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Luda and Stefan. This has been fascinating and a real pleasure to hear more about both of your perspectives and experiences and about the Ukrainian community here in the Twin Cities. I would like to, at this point, turn it over to some questions from the participants. We have had a number of questions coming into the chat. And I would like to ask my colleague, George Balbo, if he is here to help me organize and field the questions from the chat. Um, if you would be able to do that, George, and I would encourage um, participants to keep putting in your questions into the chat, and we will try to raise all of those with Luda and Stefan. Hi, this is actually Joe. Oh, uh, got sorry. Quite a few questions here in the chat. Uh, the first one is, um, it's hard to imagine anyone surviving such drastic starvation. Clearly some did. What allowed anyone to survive? Were they all allies saving, or people, saving people, or did the government Governmental change occur to stop the whole in the door? Um, that's a really good question. And I somewhat regret that uh, 
I, that's the one subject I realized after my grandmother passed away that I never really drilled down to ask her much about. She talked about boiling leather. Um, she did talk about eating rats, eating, you know, whatever animal was around. And I think those things are, when you think about it logically, that's what people would eat. What happened when all that was no longer available? How did they survive after that is a question I wish I would have um, pursued further with her. But um, I do know one of the things she mentioned was that as the Holodomor came slowly to an end and relief came to the villages, she mentioned that only those families who, for, for, who agreed to go to work on the collective farm would get food relief. And also she mentioned a requirement that children in her village called Chorno Holozivka were required to go to school at a newly established school on the Kolholsp, on the collective farm. And at that school, she remembers very distinctly that there was a language she was not very well able to communicate it. And so later on in life, of course, she learned that um, they were, the language of instruction was Russian. I so, would like to, mm -hmm, go ahead. yeah. I would like to add that um, uh, some families, it's a known fact, were able to hide uh, uh, some uh, grains or uh, potatoes, um, you know, in, in underground. And so if it wasn't found, they were lucky to use that. And sometimes they uh, could share with the people, maybe their friends or family. Um, but um, so there were also instances uh, where desperate parents uh, would go to the train station and actually throw their children into the wagons, into the trains uh, that were going towards cities because cities, uh, situation in the cities were a little better. Uh, specifically, I read about this um, in the area of Kharkiv. Uh, and, that, and that's how some people survived too. Um, a very tragic and sad uh, thing that happened during the Holodomor. Uh, there were instances of cannibalism and people do not want to talk about that at all, but, but that happened. It's, 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 a, it's a horrible, horrible thing. Um, um, I can no I animals, Just a second, Stefan. So there were no, people were eating animals, dogs, cats, they all disappeared, everything that was moving birds. So people who came to the areas after the Holodomor that were struck the hardest, they, they were finding empty uh, villages, empty, of, devoid of any life, any animal life as well. Um, so um, as you can imagine, it was um, uh, very, very difficult. And I was sure, Stefan, if you wanted to add anything there at the end. Just that my grandmother mentioned, um, probably the mo one of the more common, um, more frequent <laughs> stories she mentioned about Holodomor was how for a certain time period, uh, when it was springtime, her mother hid her, made her and her brothers uh, hide in the root cellar during the daytime because the neighbor was um, assumed to have been thriving or surviving because of having had Oh, I am so sorry. That is not good. I don't know if you could hear that. It was my phone going off, so I just turned it off. Um, but uh, that he was rumored to have been a cannibal. Very, very challenging times. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question. Um, how does the Ukrainian community practice solidarity with other victimized people, including uh, Jews and Armenians? I, um, as far as I understand, as far as I know, um, we are trying to attend, the members of the Ukrainian community uh, trying to uh, attend events that um, either Armenian or Jewish community organize. Uh, we also uh, teach about uh, Holocaust and Armenian genocide. 
when we talk about genocide, when we talk about Holtomor to children in our community. Um, so that's, um, I'm not aware of any other um, special or, you know, events that, efforts, I would say, that uh, for participation. Um, so this past, um, this past year, Ukrainian community, uh, with the help of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, um, have uh, worked, uh, have attended the events that our Armenian community uh, organized. For example, uh, we attended the exhibit uh, dedicated to um, survivors of Armenian genocide. We also uh, have met with the representatives of the Armenian uh, community uh, where we discussed uh, the possibilities not possi possibilities as well, but we also discussed the ways our communities deal with uh, issues of memory, uh, survival. Uh, we were very grateful, we are very grateful to the Armenian uh, community for uh, willing to share their experiences because they've been very successful in um, raising the awareness about the Armenian genocide. And this is something that we could learn from. Um, as a, a representative, as the director for the education at the Ukrainian Community Center, um, uh, I'm, we have plans and work to um, start working closer with other communities that experience genocide, including um, the Jewish community. And uh, after hearing the presentation from the Maya uh, community, I'm very, very interested to work with them as well. So overall, our work in uh, raising um, awareness about the Holdemort, I think, would be leading us to closer collaboration uh, with the communities that also experience the Holdemort. So that's something that I personally would like uh, to do, and um, that would be my goal for the future. And I'll say that something also that, that Father Tadios talked about last night was the exciting his excitement about being able to work more with the Ukrainian community and these um, these connections that we're able to put together. I think are really exciting. We're actually planning to have the Armenian genocide uh, exhibit at the Ukrainian center, but because of COVID, all the plans um, you know failed, kind of didn't work out. But uh, hopefully, once this situation with COVID is over, we'll be able to. Uh, move uh, forward with our plans and we'll have that exhibit. I think that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, there's a, another question here. Um, says, as someone who's worked, writing a dissertation on the Holodor, I'm curious about the efforts being done to understand the famine in the Soviet Ukraine as a continu continuity of violence. We often refer to 1932 and 1933, but cannot forget the famines of 1921, 1922, and 1946 and 47. What can we do to better incorporate a more comprehensive study of the famine in Ukraine? That's an interesting question. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind, and if the individual is writing a dissertation and probably is aware of Andrea uh, Graziosi, uh, an Italian scholar who has contextualized the whole of the more, um, you know, and put it in the context of a great uh, war against the peasantry, a Soviet war against the peasantry, an ongoing um, <clears throat> war. He was very much a vocal proponent of the, um, you know, said that 1932 to 33 in Ukraine was a, was a genocide, um, but he also looked at um, Soviet policy towards the peasantry in general, but in particular against Ukrainians. So I, that's the first thought that comes to my mind as um, as a way of further furthering knowledge, like looking into Graziosi's work. Um, um, I, I could maybe suggest getting in touch with the Ukrainian institutions because there is now more and more uh, 
information in English. Also, there is, for example, um, uh, Holodomor Museum in, in Kiev, uh, and they have um, staff that speak English, and um, mm -hmm. they, their website has a lot of information in English. And so I, I know I've been in touch with them, um, and they actually provided the newest uh, documentary that they created um, on Holodomor that's been added to our Holodomor uh, guide. Uh, and so they were very responsive to to my request, and I'm sure that it'd be true. There's also also Institute of National Memory in in Kiev in Ukraine. Um, I know they've been doing uh, a lot of work. Um, so and uh, obviously there are universities. I I'm aware of, for example, uh, a new uh, department uh, on genocide studies that's been opened in Pearson University. So th there are resources and uh, if you would like us to help you get in touch with any of those institutions, uh, uh, just please leave your email in the chat and we'll, we'll try um, you know, to help you out with that. Oh, thank you. Uh, there's another question here. Beyond the movies and books that you've recommended, how else would you recommend someone who isn't a part of the Ukrainian community to be able to more, learn more about the Holodomor? Um, are there any local events or resources um, that can be aimed at a, a larger uh, or broader public? So uh, <clears throat> this past year, uh, our Ukrainian center, um, with the help of this uh, center of Holocaust and Genocide Studies created a Holdemore guide, uh, which is uh, on the website of the, of the center. So th there are a lot of resources uh, listed uh, on that, uh, in that guide. Uh, a lot of resources are um, in Canada because Canadians have been doing a lot of work around this. Um, so Usually, like, like I mentioned uh, in my presentation, uh, Ukrainian Holodomor commemoration happens um, in November. So uh, if uh, someone wanted to attend one of those events, whether it's a public lecture or exhibit, uh, uh, please uh, also you can send an email so that and we would add you to our email list or you can just follow our Facebook page where we post all of our events. Also, I have to um, uh, let you know that at this time we're already planning, um, it's in the works, a uh, presentation of a, a Canadian uh, historian uh, for the upcoming uh, Holdemore commemoration in November. Uh, it's still in the works, like I said, but it's something to look forward to. So that, those would be the ways to um, you know, get engaged. Um, besides watching documentaries or reading books here locally. And of course, to find your, your book coming out soon, hopefully will be an excellent addition to the resources. And um, uh, the family oral history memoirs, because the, for my, my own personal family um, recollections, but the oral history project book is also available, um, the collection of interviews. Uh, is available uh, in manuscript form from the Anderson Library. There, there is a question about the, the archives. Um, do either of you know who's been accessing, if they've been used yet? Um, are, they, are they part of any research yet? I'm not aware of them being part of the research yet, but I know immediately after, I, after uh, the information was published on our Facebook, <laughs> one of the questions under the post was, okay, when is it going to be available? Uh, how can I uh, get access to it? And it was uh, uh, somebody who uh, was doing research on it. So uh, from what I've heard, uh, there was a great interest and people started accessing it already. But I'm not sure if it's been used already, you know, if, how or when it's been used in the research yet. It's been pretty recent. It's been only um, added to the library in October, at the end of October of um, 
so there's been a lot of talk about Ukrainian identity um, and um, and Ukrainians um, as victims during the genocide. But um, there's a question about other groups within Ukraine that have been resettled there, like, for instance, um, perhaps Germans that have been settled in, in Ukraine. Are there, uh, were they also targeted towards the genocide or was it solely targeted towards Ukrainians? That's a good question. Um, the starvation, of course, affected everyone. And Ukraine, the majority population and the minority population alike. Um, so, yes, our narrative was quite focused on the experience of the genocide as the genocide of the Ukrainian people, but there were plenty of other populations in Ukraine that were caught up, shall we say, in the dragnet, for better or for worse. Well, for not, not for better, but obviously for worse. And, and I think this is uh, kind of an, an opinion question, um, but you do talk about um, Timothy Snyder's definition of genocide at one point. Um, sorry, I just accidentally rolled past the question, so I'm sorry. Wait one second. Um, <clears throat> You know, how we need to speak more about how bringing genocides like the Almodovar and America's American Indian violence um, toward, you know, into this umbrella of, an, of, of genocide. How do you think we can broaden our application of the term genocide? Uh, what do you mean? I'm not quite sure what when people say broaden because. Uh, uh, the genocide uh, definition was determined already, and so there are certain uh, points that have to be um, present for an event to be considered a genocide. So uh, I, I, I don't think it can be broadened by general public. Uh, so, but when we have when we talk about atrocities that are committed um, in different parts of the world. Um, against uh, indigenous people, uh, then, you know, definitely uh, we, we have to uh, make sure that we're joining the fight where possible and uh, adding to their voices. Um, for example, in um, Ukraine, in Crimea, the Crimean Tatars are indigenous population and uh, they suffered greatly during the Second World War when Stalin deported them uh, from Crimea in 1944 because he was considering them, them traitors. And so, uh, and now Crimea is a, so they were able to return to Crimea in the 90s after Ukraine became independent. Um, but uh, now many of them still have to leave uh, Crimea. Many of them left Crimea and those who are living in Crimea are persecuted. They're not able, the Crimean Tatars newspapers are not uh, able to function or a TV station is closed. Uh, the buildings that belong to Crimean Tatars, Tatar um, organizations are closed as well. And uh, uh, there are political um, prisoners um, in Russia, Crimean Tatar political prisoners in Russia as well. So, uh, you know, Ukraine and Ukrainians have been um, supporting them in their um, struggle. And of course, um, Ukraine demands that um, no country in the world uh, was um, accepting uh, Crimea as a Russian territory. Um, so um, I, I would just say that um, in, uh, in any case, in, with any indigenous group, uh, it's always good to um, find out what it's about and then do what you can to raise awareness about the issue or in any other way. But work closely with people who are organizing um, events for that community. 
no, as for the um, the question pertaining to how Timothy Snyder may or may not have defined genocide, or I think maybe what what that question stimulates in me, and I don't know the the history in much detail, but I, my understanding is that, for example, Raphael Lemkin's definition of genocide was of one nature, and then there was a struggle within the UN to define it as a UN convention. And the Soviet Union played quite a role in making the definition almost impossible or very, very difficult to match, to, to, ha to use as a labor, label for a variety of situations that, that Lemkin, for example, in the Ukrainian instance, would have said this was obviously a genocide. Um, I've had the opportunity to hear Timothy Snyder speak twice. Um, and uh, in, a private co in a comment to people outside of one of his um, presentations, I overheard him saying that the question of genocide, of whether or not the Ukrainian uh, Holodomor was a genocide or not, is, it, is not even an interesting question. It so obviously is such. Um, so uh, I think there's a tension between the legal definition and how strict of a legal definition and how a common knowledge about when a nation of people are being attacked. That's what uh, the question makes me think of. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Um, in a lot of, of communities where we see a diaspora, the country or the communities within the U.S. here tend to be more uh, at the forefront of commemorating uh, the genocide. I think of uh, the Armenian community here has, has been able to commemorate the Armenian genocide longer than back in Armenia. Um, I'm wondering, Luda or, or Stefan, if you could talk a little bit about how either the Ukrainian community here supports uh, commemoration in Ukraine, or if the reverse happens, does Ukraine support uh, commemoration here more? So, um, as I mentioned in my presenta presentation, the uh, Holodomor commemoration happens in November, and it's uh, commemorated by Ukrainians not only in diaspora, it's in Ukraine, it's, and it's a worldwide commemoration. So, we, we can't really say that it's commemorated more there or here. It, it is commemorated at this time everywhere in the uh, all the cities, towns, villages in Ukraine, and in all the cities where Ukrainian diaspora lives here as well. Uh, that event that I talk about, the light uh, candle of memory uh, on the night of commemoration, that, that really is happening. So if there is no, for example, a talk that's given, or there is no exhibit, there is at least this one Thing that's happening during on, on that day, um, so uh, people just uh, you know say a prayer with the family, and then they, they light a candle, and uh, that's how they uh, remember the victims of the Holodomor. So it, it really there is no difference at, at this time, uh, whether it's in Ukraine or in the diaspora. That's great. Thank you, Luda and Stefan, and thank you, Joe, for fielding those questions. I think we are just about at our time. Uh, so I will, we will wrap it up there and say that if anyone else had questions, um, you could contact us, uh, any of the center staff on the center's website, and we could direct your questions or connect you with Luda and Stefan that way. Um, and I will just say again, this video, as well as the previous three conversations from other communities will be posted to the center's YouTube channel. So you can see that um, this one will be posted in, in the next day or two. Uh, and the rest are already on there. I think next week, we start a next series of this, um, this work, which will be educator workshops. So we have um, three workshops that are specifically aimed at educators to discuss teaching about these difficult histories and navigating 
trauma in school and community education settings. So please do check those out. Uh, and it will be, those will be hosted virtually too. And the information is on the center's website. And uh, I think that just about wraps up our event this evening and call it this finishing this uh, Bridges of Memory series. So thank you again, Luda and Stefan for joining us. Thank you, Maria and Nicole for interpreting and Joe and George and Alejandro for the help hosting tonight. And thank you to the whole audience for joining us this evening. It's been fascinating. Thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you all.